And now we're back to Stuff Those Seeds with your host, Louis Clark. Hello, hello, all you beautiful people. We're here with Jarrett Davey, who's made history on our show by stuffing a record-breaking 58 seeds underneath his tongue. How you feeling, Jarrett? Uh, oh, What's the matter? Seeds got your tongue? Uh -huh. All right, Jarrett. I know you already have just like a whole bunch of seeds under your tongue, but here's a reminder to our audience and the viewers watching at home. If he can stuff just seven more seeds in there, right, just right up in there, he gets to survive the winter! But if he can't, he'll go home empty-handed. So what do you think, Jarrett? Are you up for the challenge? All right, then without further ado, let's stop those, those seeds! Is he gonna make it? <laughs> Clark's nutcrackers are my favorite bird. We're here in San Bernardino National Forest, just north of Big Bear Lake in California, which also happens to be the southernmost range of the Clark's Nutcracker, named so for famed explorer William Clark of Lewis and Clark. The Clark's Nutcracker, or Nusifraga Columbiana, may not look like much, but pretty much the only way I can discern them when I'm birding is by the white T-shape on their tail and wings in flight. They don't have any other exciting colors and their call isn't exactly the prettiest in the forest. In fact, David Allen Sibley uses the word harsh twice when describing their vocalizations. But if you take the Clark's Nutcracker just for what it is at face value, you'll be missing out on quite a bit. So what is it that's so great about them? Well, to dig into the answer, let's play a game. No, no, get that away, that's for later. Take a look at this grid. On it, there are 1,000 unoccupied squares. I'm gonna go ahead and put up 100 X's in randomly generated locations. If you want, pause the video and memorize it. Be my guest. All right, you got it all? Take it away. And back up. And you know what, just for fun, let's go ahead and turn it upside down. Now, how many X's, if you were to pause the video, do you think you could find? Yeah. It's not easy. Something I want to discuss today is how exactly we process that kind of information. How do we know and remember where an object is in space? Turns out that is a very loaded question, and I am very unqualified to talk about it. But just like any other red-blooded American, I'll plow through straight away on this topic I know approximately this much about. It has to do with spatial memory, which is something humans are only okay at? It's hard to say definitively. Anything having to do with the brain or with memory is really complicated science, and spatial memory is no different. It's a very active area of research. But we do know it's something that Clark's Nutcrackers excel at. And to be fair, one test of spatial memory doesn't inherently equal another, so our little grid game doesn't necessarily mean our spatial cognition is bad. I'm just trying to give you a little taste of what it is a Clark's Nutcracker has to deal with. Imagine a much bigger grid with undefined cells spreading for miles in every direction. Imagine having to find thousands of X's instead of just a hundred. And shoot, you haven't looked at that grid in months and now there's snow covering it. And on top of that, imagine that if you didn't find the X's, you'd starve to death. Now replace the X's with seeds and you have exactly what it is a Clark's Nutcracker does every single year. Clark's Nutcrackers have one of the greatest spatial memories in the animal kingdom. Not just the birds, in the entire animal kingdom. Throughout autumn, an individual nutcracker can bury over 30,000 seeds in what are called caches, basically hiding spots, over a massive range. And it locates these tens of thousands of buried seeds to use as a food source throughout the cold months, and even as long as until the next autumn. They usually only have four to five seeds in a cache, so the number of caches it has to memorize? Yeah. And this is a conservative estimate too. Some studies believe an individual nutcracker can pick as many as 100,000 seeds in a season and store them in up to 20,000 caches. To do something like this that requires a Herculean ability to locate something small and something so big and do it tens of thousands of times, a superior spatial memory is mandatory. 
During the fall, they'll get their bills into thousands of pine cones, extracting seeds at a rate of 32 per minute from pine trees just like this one. Right now it's October here in mountainous Big Bear, so Clark's nutcrackers are hard at work burying all those seeds in their caches. They store the information of the locations of these thousands of caches, potentially under inches of snow, and they rely on spatial memory to do it. So I've thrown those words around a lot, but let's go ahead and scratch the surface of what they actually mean. We'll call this spatial memory 101, or maybe 100.001. Again, it's hard to say anything definitively here, and comparing our spatial memory to another animal's might be like apples and oranges. But hey, sometimes you have to be unconventional. Oh. Part of the reason it's sort of an unfair comparison is because of the different ways that we as humans and other animals commit spatial information to memory. For example, there's a lot of evidence that humans have something called grid cells, which are literally brain cells, neurons, that fire at very notably regular intervals as we move around a place, literally looking like a triangular grid, committing spatial information to memory here, here, and here, and here. We also have place cells, which fire at very specific locations in an environment, and are part of the reason that if you walk into a place, you'll be flooded with memories about things that happened there. Well, I guess Tchaikovsky was right about one thing. Nutcrackers are pretty sweet. <laughs> oh my god, what a stupid f joke. That wasn't even funny, like at all. That took five hours, you know? Yeah, this, this, was, not, this was not a good time. Not at all. Not at all. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I, let's, let's cut. Those are by far not the only ways that humans process spatial information, it's just a little taste of it. Clark's Nutcrackers handle spatial knowledge differently, but by studying them we can perhaps get a better idea of what's going on in our own heads. Scientists believe that they measure distances at each cache site. So I'm making a cache here, I see that tree is 15 feet away, that tree is 24 feet. But other researchers think the angle is more important. Um, I'm making a cache here, I'm facing that tree, I see that rock is 73 degrees to my left. So measuring angles and distances, this is how they find a cache buried under the snow. When committing a cache site to memory, they don't necessarily take information directly around them into account, but rather larger objects further away that they can still see buried in snow, like mountains and big trees and rocks. They triangulate points, they do geometry. There have even been studies where researchers locate a nutcracker cache and then shift particular objects around that cache, and when the nutcracker then looks for its seeds in the wrong location, researchers know that they rely on distances and angles of very particular objects in their vicinity. What's even cooler is that you can then extrapolate that to show that for the thousands of caches a nutcracker has, they memorize thousands of specific images with distances and angles worked out for each one. And if you don't think that's cool, then come on. 
Nutcracker brains aren't exactly huge. So where is all this information kept in a brain that's about this big? Well, the answer is the same as for anything having to do with neuroscience. It's complicated, to say the least. But there is one part of the brain that we know of that is extremely important to our understanding of our placement or the placement of an object in space. The part of the brain that might be the most integral to that is the hippocampus, a small part of your temporal lobe located right there. And I say the word small in a sense that, yes, our hippocampus is small relative to the rest of our brain, as you can see in the diagram, but it's also small in a sense relative to that of other animals, like the Clark's nutcracker. Or maybe it's more apt to say the Clark's Nutcrackers is large. See, our hippocampus takes about 0.42% of our brain. The Clark's Nutcracker, 6.01%. Yeah. And again, I don't want to give the impression that this is the explicit comprehensive way to know the prowess of an animal's spatial memory. It's not. There's a lot more to it. But it's still an important measure. And we know that it is because of everything we've talked about so far. The Clark's Nutcracker has remarkable spatial memory. How else could it find thousands of seed caches in a landscape that becomes nigh unrecognizable? And if the Clark's Nutcracker's hippocampus is that large relative to the rest of its brain, then can we say definitively that the larger an animal's hippocampus, the better spatial memory it has? Maybe. Probably. I don't know. The point I'm trying to make here is, we're still figuring a lot of these things out about the world and about ourselves, because, like it or not, most of our brain is still a mystery to us. Those grid and place cells I mentioned earlier, those are just two kinds of neurons in your hippocampus, which has over 100 distinct kinds of neurons, all which relay different kinds of information and that are all connected to each other in ways we still don't quite understand. And remember, that's just 0.42% of our brain. We haven't even touched on the other 99.58%. So why is any of this important? Why does this matter? I may not know much about the extremely complex and valuable world of spatial memory, but I do know one thing. The Clark's Nutcracker is very important to it, and therefore important to our understanding of our brain as a whole. And since our brain is essentially everything that we are, and there's still so much we don't know about it, perhaps we can learn a lot about ourselves, not just by looking inward, but also by looking upward. All right, let's do one more thing. Something else that's wicked awesome about Clark's Nutcrackers is a specialized organ they have, something called a sanolingual pouch, sorry, blah, sublingual pouch. <laughs> and that's sort of exactly what it sounds like. Lingua is Latin for tongue, and sub is just a prefix meaning under. So a sublingual pouch just means a pouch under the tongue. The special pocket that Clark's Nutcrackers have is where they store pine seeds, and they can store up to 95 individual seeds in that pouch. That may not sound like much, but it's the equivalent of me carrying a bowling ball in my mouth. And one of the heavy ones too, the kind that you never even tried to use, but your dad would when he used sticky bowling. You know, with your Uncle Steve before leaving you at Lucky Strike after Eric Foster's birthday party, even though he didn't even know Eric, so why did he and Uncle Steve stay in bowl in the first place? And then you end up being the last kid there with Eric's mom, even though she's tired after hosting a party for a bunch of third graders, and Eric just wants to go home and play with his toys, but they can't because you're eight and Lucky Strike is in the bad part of town. You know the kind with the big holes? And not only that, but Clark's Nutcrackers can fly up to 14 miles with all those seeds in their pouch. Talk about strength. So, let's go over what we learned today. I can't fit a lot of seed in my mouth, but a Clark's Nutcracker can. They store it under their tongue. I'll have to take note. They're also pretty great at finding the seeds that they bury. That's due to their spatial memory, which is important because Clark's Nutcrackers have huge hippocampi. Um, you know what? I guess I kind of went depth over breath with this one. But you take those few things and you have why the Clark's Nutcracker, without a doubt, is my favorite bird. So that's the video for today. I hope you guys had fun on this birding adventure with me here in very beautiful Big Bear. I'll catch you guys later.